Wonderful to hear our church choir again. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> and a beautiful song as well. Allow everybody to be seated for a second here, and then we'll bow our heads. All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for bringing us together on this beautiful day. We thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you for all that the Sabbath reminds us of, all that you have done for us. And now, Lord, I pray that you would be with, we, be with me as I speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You never forget an unexpected kindness. I remember when my wife and I had just moved to Dallas, Texas. And we were doing a little bit of furniture shopping because in the move, a couple of our bookcases had gotten damaged. And so we needed to find something to replace them. And so we were going to kind of used furniture kind of areas. We didn't need anything fancy. We just needed something to hold our books. And so we went to a place and they had some nice, uh, nice bookcases there in our price range. And so, you know, we said, yeah, okay, we'll take them. These will work for us. And then we thought to ourselves, how are we getting these home? <laughs> See, at the time, we were driving around in a little two-door convertible. <laughs> Not exactly a car that's good for transporting furniture. We'd only been there a day, maybe two, and in that time, we had reached out to some people, and we'd, we'd made a few friends. We just, we'd met them once. We bonded over our enjoyment of board games, and we had shared with them this dilemma that we had, that you know, we're going to get some furniture, we found some, we're not exactly sure how we're going to do it, we might have to rent a, a U-Haul or something, or rent a truck. And these people that we had just met, who we had just become friends with, said, oh, we have an SUV, we'll come and we'll help move them for you. And, you know, of course, for them, it wasn't a big deal, it just took a little bit of time out of their day. But we never forgot that, because here are some people who we just met, you know, we, they don't know us that well, we don't know them that well, and yet they're volunteering to help us set up our new home. We never forget unexpected kindnesses. That little thing just stays with us all these years later. This week, in our Bible reading, we've been reading through the Gospel of John lately, as we've been reading through the New Testament as a church. And this week, we read about an unexpected kindness that Jesus did for his disciples. And it's something that we commemorate when we do a communion service as well. We read about how Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And that, we know, was a dirty job. That was not the kind of job that a master, a teacher, someone of, of high honor would have done. You know, we sometimes get a little bit weird about our feet today, but in those days, they walked around in the sandals all the day, there was manure, dung, and, and refuse in the streets that you'd be walking through. Your feet were not particularly nice to look at, in other words. It's not something that you wanted to touch. It was certainly not something that anyone with any kind of status would have done to wash someone's feet. And yet Jesus showed an unexpected kindness to his disciples when he takes on the dirty job of washing their feet. And so today, I just want to share a few thoughts on that. It's not going to be a full sermon. We do have a communion service we're going to participate in today as well. But a few thoughts on John chapter 13 and that story of how Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And so I invite you to turn there, if you would, John chapter 13. And we'll be starting in the very first verse. So John 13, verse 1. In John 13, verse 1, in many ways, it introduces the story of, of the foot washing, but it also introduces the whole second half of the gospel. This is the turning point, because we know that Jesus is soon to die. And in John 13, verse 1, it says, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own, who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And we'll stop there for now. 
And so John, as he is introducing this story, the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, John is telling us what we should be paying attention to. And, and John is telling us that when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, Jesus is demonstrating his love. The full extent, John says, the full extent of his love by humiliating himself, by taking on the role of a servant, and by serving his disciples. He is showing them his love. And, and John, I think, wants to make sure we get the point because he bookends this story with love. He introduces it, as we see here in, in John uh, 13, verse 1. He tells us that Jesus shows his love and then goes on to wash the disciples' feet. But at the end of the story, we're skipping ahead a little bit now because I want to make this point, in verse 34 and 35, so still John 13, but now verse 34 and 35, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet at this point, and he's explained to them why he did it, that, uh, that he was giving them an example. And then he goes on to say this, John 13, now in verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so we see bookending this story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, this call, this challenge to love. Jesus says, I'm about to be away from you. I'm about to depart. And so the way that people will know that you are my disciples is if you love. Before, you could tell who Jesus' disciples were because they were right next to Jesus. <laughs> when Jesus came into town, he would have a, a crowd of people with him, and you'd see, okay, yeah, those are the disciples. But when Jesus left, well, they wouldn't be next to Jesus anymore. So how would we tell that you are still followers of Jesus? Jesus says it's not by a name tag. It's not by introducing yourself as a Christian. It's not by necessarily you handing out tracts. It's by showing love. That's how they will know that you are my disciples. And notice in verse 34, uh, the Let's see, one, the second sentence, the second full sentence of verse 34. Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Because the truth is, we cannot selflessly love others if we have not first experienced God's perfect love in our own life. Jesus shows us how to love by him loving us first. And so there's a connection. We cannot become these amazing, humble servants of God unless we have first experienced God's love for ourselves. And when we have experienced that love, when we understand what it means to be forgiven, when we understand all that it implies that Jesus died for us, we can then take that and show that love to the world as well. Starting within the walls of our church, it, we, we start by loving each other as a church, and we learn how to love each other that way, and then we can go out into the world and love others as well. In our culture, when you talk about love, oftentimes it's in, it's in the context of a feeling. Say, I fell in love, right? I have butterflies in my stomach. My heart skipped a beat. Love oftentimes in our culture, in our society, is all about how you feel. And if I don't feel particularly warm and fuzzy towards you, well, then I don't love you. That's the idea of our society. Love is a feeling. But in the Bible, love is less a feeling and more an action. Love is something that you do. Love is a verb. <laughs> and that's why it says in verse 1 that Jesus showed them the full extent of his love. How? By doing, by serving by becoming a servant to the disciples and washing their feet. And so when Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciple if you love one another, Jesus is not saying you need to have a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart all the time. Jesus is saying we serve each other. We demonstrate love to each other by becoming a servant to one another, by doing the dirty job sometimes, by helping move the furniture. <laughs> 
by doing those things that people might not want to do. We serve others, and by serving them, we show that we love them. And in many ways, what Jesus says was a prophecy, because we know that in the early Christian church, they got a reputation for their loving acts of service. There's a Roman emperor by the name of Julian. He was pagan, didn't much care for the Christians one bit, and famously he wrote this letter. He wrote, he wrote more in the letter, but he wrote this part of a letter where he was complaining about the difference between his own pagan religion and the religion of the Christians, who he didn't like. He said, when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by our priests, remember the pagan priests, then I think the impious Christians observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. They support not only their poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. This is a pagan Roman emperor complaining that the Christians are well known for their acts of service, well known for their love. Why can't we be like them? Jesus says, they will know we are his disciples by our love. And so when we wash each other's feet, it is a reminder to us to take those dirty jobs, to do those acts of service, to show love to each other within our church community and to the world as well. Now, it can be difficult to do that. It can be difficult to take the dirty job. We want to be respected. We want people to look up, for us, uh, look up to us. That's just part of being in our culture. It's part of being human. And so how can we, like Jesus, humble ourselves, take those dirty jobs that maybe we would not want to do? Well, I invite you to turn back to verse uh, 3. John 13, verse 3. And in John 13, verse 3, it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. There's a fascinating connection in the story between the fact that Jesus knew fully who he was. He knew that he was the Son of God. He knew that he came from heaven. He knew that he was going back to the Father. The gospel connects that knowledge, that understanding, with Jesus' ability to humble himself. Jesus knew that he could humble himself, he could be a servant, because he knew where his true value came from. He understood that he was the Son of God, and so he didn't care about playing the game of respect and honor. He didn't care about how people looked up to him, because he knew who his Father was. And when we understand who our Father is, when we understand that we are created of God, saved by Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross for us, when we understand where our true meaning comes from, we can take those dirty jobs. We don't worry so much about humbling ourselves or about being proud, proud or prideful. We can, we can just go about the work of serving others when we know who our Father is. Is. And it connects with love too, doesn't it? As we said, when we experience that love of the Father, when we experience that love of Jesus, it allows us to serve others as well. And one final point I want to make, like I said, I want to make this short. We want to uh, focus on the communion service here. But one final point, and that comes from verse 12 and following. So if you turn to John 13 still, but now in verse 12, Jesus has washed his disciples' feet uh, Peter protests and says, no, no, I'm, I'm not worthy. Um, but, but Jesus goes ahead and explains to him that, no, I need to wash your feet as well. And then after he washes the feet, he even washes the feet of Judas, by the way. So an amazing thought there, that even as Judas is planning to betray Jesus, Jesus still washes his feet. But then in verse 12, Jesus explains. And he says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done 
for you. And just in a few minutes, we'll be doing that very thing. We'll be washing each other's feet as part of our communion celebration to emulate what Christ has done for us. Then he goes on to say in verse 16, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And Jesus is making the point that if I, the Son of God, the one who is there at creation, the one who is here to save you, if I have humbled myself to serve you, well, then you have no excuse. <laughs> you need to serve each other. But there's a point here that is often missed. And unfortunately, most of our translations don't really bring this out, although some might mention it in a footnote. That, mess, that, that uh, word in verse 16, messenger, or in some Bibles, it's the one who is sent. That word in Greek is literally apostle. Apostle, that's what apostle means, one who is sent. And we see a progression in the Gospels where for most of the Gospels, there are the 12 disciples, right? Disciple literally means student, someone who is just following someone, learning from them. And so there are 12 disciples, but then Acts comes and they go from being 12 disciples to being apostles, not people who are just there to learn, but people who are going out, missionaries who are sent out by God to spread the message. There is this shift from disciple, a student, to apostle, a messenger. And this is the very first place in John's gospel where we see this word, apostle. And I think Jesus is saying here that when we love each other, when we become servants for each other, when we take on those dirty jobs for each other, it is at that point that we graduate. And we move from being just a disciple, someone who is a fan of the Bible, someone who likes to learn lots of good stuff, and we become an apostle, someone who God can send out into the world to spread his gospel. Because if we do not have a heart of a servant, if we do not have God's love in us, then we're not fit to be an apostle. We're not fit to share that love, that gospel with the world. And so if we want to be that missionary, if we want to make a difference, let us humble ourselves. Let us love each other. Let us serve each other. Let us take on those dirty jobs because we love each other and because we have been loved first. And so we're about to divide up uh, for the foot washing time now. I'm going to say a word of prayer and then I'll give you some instructions. But as we go about this communion service, let's remember the great sacrifice that Christ has done for us and the great calling that we have as his apostles to love each other just as God has loved us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have done so much for us, Lord. And when you got down on your knees and washed the dirty feet of your disciples, you showed us that we have no excuse, that we should also serve each other. We should also show our love through our actions to each other. And I pray, Lord, that you humble us. You help us to understand where our true value comes from. And that just as you loved and served us, that we also should love and serve each other. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.